Welcome to the Luke Messias Show. Here's the deal. I wrote another song. I know many of you have been demanding one, asking for one kindly. And so I have, we'll get to that in a minute. We're also going to talk about all the money that is flowing in to try to save a lot of bad Republican incumbents. I've been talking about this for the last couple months, but now that reports have come out, we have some numbers, which I will go through with you. We're going to talk about some of Dade Phelan's lieutenants who are trying to angle to make sure that they take power from him in the event that this election cycle does not go well for him, that the existing Cardinals remain in power. Donald Trump also made some more endorsements, which we will cover. So these are several things we're going to cover today. Let's get to the show. One thing I've been talking about for the last couple months, and I've actually been emailing about this the last couple weeks, is that Austin is going to pour in so much money to try to save some bad Republican incumbents, okay? And I have something to admit to you today. I kind of underestimated how much money, because I said it was like 10, 15 million. It's way more than that, okay? And we're going to break down some of those numbers. Here's what you need to understand. Last night, I was talking to a friend, and we looked up how much the Republican governor of Idaho spent on his reelection campaign, and it was like $1.2 million, okay? I, I have friends that do politics in different states, and so you'll talk to one in Maine or one in, I don't know, for any of these other state legislatures that exist, and you say, hey... Like, what do you spend on state legislative seats? The state Senate, right? And they'll go, well, if we're, if it's a, if it's a big cycle in the primary, you know, the state Senate leadership fund, they'll raise $750,000, maybe a million dollars that they'll then spend on keeping the Senate red or keeping the Republican senators elected if they have conservative challengers, I don't, you know, various different forms. I'm going to highlight four races for you today. And these four races are four Republican incumbents who voted for Dade Phelan. Donald Trump came out and said, look, if you're still standing with Phelan, you're a fool. You're a fool is what he said. And we're going to talk about four of those individuals who are staying with Phelan, who supported him, who hosted him and said, he's my guest of honor at my fundraiser people who voted to impeach Ken Paxton, people who voted with Democrats to empower them all along the way last session, voted to kill property tax relief, voted with leadership. These are good leadership members, loyal to the team. These are also four members that did vote correctly on school choice. They voted against, they were voted for school choice. So Governor Abbott's not targeting them, um, but concert, other conservatives within the broader conservative coalition are targeting these individuals and they're all vulnerable for reelection. Okay. Now, bear in mind, keep that number in mind, like the, the governor of Idaho, $1.2 million. Okay. And you just start to look at other states. Okay. This person spent $3 million on their whole gubernatorial campaign for Arkansas governor, whatever it is. Okay. Ellen Troxclair, for her re-election so far, her January 15th report, her 30-day, and her 8-day combined, is almost $1.4 million. $1.4 million for Ellen Troxclair. J.C. Jaton, we've talked about J.C. He's one of the 15 most liberal Republicans in the Texas House on Rice University's scale. He's very loyal to the Dustin Burroughs, Greg Bodden kind of contingent of leadership in the House. $1.4 million. You can go to Transparency Texas right now on J.C. Jaton's. The only one that wasn't updated at the time of this recording was Ellen Troxclair's. So we'll see <clears throat> what happens there. But on JC's, I mean, it's 1.4 million. So Ellen, I just went to her reports and pulled the three, 150,000, 100 and something thousand, 1.1 million. The, this last report was 1 million, 90,000. Combined it all, it's like 1.4 million. JC Jaton, 1.4 million. Kronda Timish. Kronda Timish has spent over $900,000 on television alone. Alone. That's nuts. 
for a state house seat. She has spent more on television for her reelection to the Texas House than many Republican gubernatorial candidates in this nation spend on their entire gubernatorial campaigns on television. That is how hard the Austin Swamp is fighting to keep these people. She's going to spend over $1.5 million. There's no way that that is not spent in the course of her campaign. Lynn Stuckey also has now topped a million dollars. We'll probably be at 1.1, 1.2 by the time this election is done. So if you combine these people together, it's over $5 million for four Republican incumbents. I want you to think about that. $5 million for four Republican incumbents. So when I said, hey, these guys are going to pour in money. I was serious. I mean, it's like this is the level at which they know they're being threatened. And this is how hard they're working. And Dade Phelan's lieutenants know that Dade is vulnerable. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, and that that is a little bit of what will be in my new song that we will present to you. But we know Dave Phelan's vulnerable. Donald Trump has come out against him. Ken Paxton is campaigning against him. Dan Patrick is campaigning against him. Sid Miller's campaigning against him. And this is what he's done. He's backed these people into a corner. Recognize that all of these individuals are rational actors. Okay. Dade Phelan tried to impeach Ken Paxton and still calls him a criminal. That's kind I mean, that if you impeach me and try to call me a criminal, I think I'm going to campaign against you. In fact, it'd be irrational for me not to. The Texas House actually recruited one of their own members to run against him, James White. And I actually like James White. He's done a very good job in the Texas House. And he's now, I believe, at the Funeral Commission under Governor Abbott. But, I mean, the Texas House recruited this guy to run against Sid Miller in his primary and then all campaigned for him. So they tried to take this guy out. So when he's going and campaigning against members of the legislature, it's like, y'all tried to make me not the agriculture commissioner. Sid can't get his bills passed that... He believes farmers desperately need. His job is working with farmers and ranchers. He comes to the legislature and said, here's legislation that we need for farmers and ranchers. They won't help him with it. And they're going to try to defund his commission. Jared Patterson tweeted about defunding Sid Miller's department, eliminating the Department of Agriculture. That is how angry Jared Patterson is at Sid Miller for campaigning against liberal Republicans, right? So he's now saying, well, what if we just defund and get away with the agriculture department? You see, for them, it's all personal. It's not about policy. And so Sid Miller is acting as a rational actor to say, I'm going to go in and campaign against you. Dan Patrick, I've covered on the show, 50 conservative policies that Dan Patrick passed last session were just thrown away by the Texas House of Representatives. There's a lot of work that his senators put in to enacting great policy that is thrown away, disregarded. So Dade Phelan is vulnerable and his cardinals are starting to kind of try to figure it out. So the three people, in my opinion, the three people that want are working hardest to make sure that their power stays intact are Cody Harris, Dustin Burroughs, and Greg Bonnet, the chairman of appropriations, the chairman of calendars, and the chairman of local and consent. It's very important for these guys. And they... A lot of people would say that after Dade, those three are probably three that kind of run the Texas house. Okay. And, uh, and, and they might be kind of complimented by that, right? They might be like, Oh, thanks Luke for saying that. You know, I do, I do think of myself as pretty influential, but they are. And they're also just kind of the group that likes picking fights. They like picking fights with their colleagues on the house floor. They pick fights with the Senate. Morgan Meyer is kind of in that group a little bit with ways and means. So, you see these individuals all trying to kind of angle and figure out how do we make sure that we're still all in charge if Dade Phelan loses. They're already making little moves and calls and feeling people out. They know Dade's vulnerable. They know he could lose. He could win. If he wins, what is that even going to look like, right? How many, you know, again, I've talked about this before, but 
a speaker's job is to protect his members. This is what they tell you. Now, if you're asking Luke Macias, like, what do you think a good, virtuous, honorable speaker of the Texas House should prioritize? I think it's the well-being of the citizens of the state of Texas. That's what I think a speaker's job is to do, is to usher in as much policy as possible that allows for the, the state of Texas to flourish. And in order to do that, you have to protect innocence. That's why you pass bills that say you can't, you can sue your doctor if you want to detransition and realize they screwed your whole body up. It's why you make sure that insurance companies have to protect those detransitioners and provide their care. These bills that you pass, it's, it's why you pass bills that say, hey, if you have a drag queen story hour at the library, we don't fund the library anymore. That's legal. The Texas Senate passed the bill. The Texas House killed it. See, these cultural bills are about allowing your state to flourish. And a society that literally sexualizes its own children does not flourish. A society that has no borders or boundaries doesn't flourish. That's why you don't wait till the very last couple days to try to pass your border security bill with the border force. You say, we got to get this done now because our borders open and millions of people are pouring across. And that's not how you flourish. I, I have a home, right? And recently we did some, we did some additions to our fence. We have this nice wrought iron fence, but I was going to do a privacy fence. And then I'm like, this is like $8,000 of iron that is yeah, around my backyard so that I, I had this fence guy come and he, he stripped down these boards and put them in between. So it's like a privacy fence with the metal. It looks really nice, but see, we do these things cause we're like, I'm trying to protect this home. This is my, and if, if my home was a home that didn't have borders or boundaries and my, I, my doors were always open and people came in and out, that wouldn't be a protected home. That home wouldn't flourish. If when people came over to my house, there's like eight people in it and they're like, where did these people come from? You're like, I actually don't know. See, we don't really have doors in this house or a fence and people just live in our backyard and they're like, what happened? This is not a flourishing household. This is chaos. This is what I believe the responsibility of a speaker would be. And a responsibility of a speaker in that situation, as that is, if that's the hierarchy, then you have to say, how do I work with the lieutenant governor to pass as much of this as possible? How do I work with the attorney general and the agriculture commissioner and the governor to try to build unity to advance as much as possible? But that's not what the Texas House has been. Now, what the Texas House members say is the speaker's job is to protect me. But here's what's really fascinating is Dade Phelan is really bad at his job that the members gave him. Because remember, we as Texans, we would say the speaker needs to pass as much policy that would allow Texas to flourish. But his own members are like, you need to protect us. And he's done the opposite of that. He takes them all and he throws them into fight after fight after fight. Go, hey, screw the agriculture commissioner. Hurt his department. Maybe we'll do away with it. Go to war with the attorney general. Call him a criminal. Try to get him out of office. Yeah, who cares about the lieutenant governor, the senators, all the bills they passed? Well, they worked a lot faster than us, Mr. Speaker. They passed all this stuff. We got to get to it. Now, slow it down. That'll teach him a lesson. So he's cutting them up every time he does that. And then they got to go back to their district. And everyone's like, I don't want Democrat chairs. And they're like, well. And then they start making all these excuses up. And we've talked about that on the show. We can't pass constitutional amendments. So he's cutting them up left and right. He's vulnerable and his lieutenants are all just trying to figure out how to angle and figure out how, how am I going to hold my power? That's the question. How do we hold our power? But when I come back to you next week, the election will have taken place. At the time I'm speaking, 35 to 40% of the vote might have already been cast. That's where we're at. So we'll have some results. And I just want to remind all of you, we do not control the outcome of elections. When I say we, I mean you and me. Some of you that listen and follow the show I know are donors. Some of you are heads of organizations. Some of you are Republican precinct chairmen. Some of you are county chairs and serve on the SREC. Some of you are business people. Some of you go to church and you're involved. And all of you care about the state of Texas, but I just need you to know that ultimately, even all of us together, 
do not control the outcome of elections. Okay. And you need to remind yourself about that because now is not the time to be worried or anxious or stressed. It's a time to remind yourself that the reason you engage in this process is because you feel called to do so. And if you don't feel called to do so, if you're like, I really feel called to go to Africa and be a missionary, then go to Africa and be a missionary, okay? I really feel called to move to Idaho and plant a church. Well, you should. And by the way, you could run for governor with $1.2 million instead of five. So go to Idaho, plant a church, run for governor, and just, you know, get JC Jatan to be your fundraiser because evidently money just flows into this guy's account. He's not actually fundraising, by the way. And people are just throwing money into it because they just know this guy is, you know, he does what he's told. You got to give him a lot of money. He does what he's told. So that you probably shouldn't hire JC Jatan as your fundraiser. Don't do this if you're not called to do it. But I feel called to be engaged in this battle. And I hope you do too. And I think you probably do if you listen or watch this show to some level. It doesn't mean you're there full time. You might have a job and have your family. And there's a hierarchy of your responsibilities. First and foremost, if you're, for me, as a man of faith, it's to God, then it's to my wife, and then children, and then church, and then community around me, people, my neighbor, right? But at some point down that hierarchy comes civic involvement and engagement, and your actual job. So, just remember, you don't control the outcome of elections. And that's not why you do this. You do not engage in the political process to control the outcome of elections. And if that's why you're engaging, then just buckle up and be ready to be stressed all the time. It'll drive you nuts. So please don't. Are you worried about your kid's future? You should be. I'm Charles Blaine with Texas Tomorrow. This is a show where we're gonna talk about the issues and the people that are pushing the policies that concern your family, your home, and your kids. Catch Texas tomorrow, every Thursday. Guys, we have a major problem. Let me talk to y'all about this real quick. We have these public schools that are literally using your tax dollars to campaign for people that will keep money flowing into their pockets with zero accountability and no change in structure. Okay, so whether it's Steve Allison or Glenn Rogers or John Kemple or Reggie Smith, we now have all these schools. We have literally like superintendents or principals who are emailing people in the government and they're like, hey, go vote for Hugh Shine. He's our state representative and he helps all of us. He passes the teacher union stuff and he kills stuff the teacher union's not on board with. It's a major problem. I wish the attorney general could take these people to court, but the court of criminal appeals has completely gutted his ability to do that, which is why Donald Trump actually endorsed the three conservative court of criminal appeals candidates, Lee Finley, Gina Parker, and David Schenck. And we're going to get to Trump's endorsements in a second, but I want to finish this school thing. Guys, it is a major problem that government institutions are working to keep elected liberal Republican incumbents who protect those institutions. That is a violation of the sacred trust that citizens have with its government. Okay. The government cannot use its own resources to keep elected people who will just protect the government institution. That's not legal. The problem is the attorney general has been had his hands tied behind his back. So that's a problem, a major problem. We have, we have to stop these institutions now. Do you want Texas to stay red? Then stop these government institutions from being campaign vehicles with your money. They take your money. They overtax you, they take your money, and then they use it as a campaign machine. So Donald Trump came out and said, yes, I'm going to endorse Ken Paxton Slate for the Court of Criminal Appeals. That's awesome. Fantastic. Lee Finley, Gina Parker, David Shank. 
But he also endorsed quite a few other candidates. Brent Money in House District 2, the special election. We talked about this election, the special election that happened where like over 100 Beto O'Rourke donors voted. About 1,000 Democrats came out and voted to elect Jill Dutton in that special election by 111 votes. The good news is less of those people will vote in the primary and more Republicans will vote as a whole. And Donald Trump came out and endorsed Brent Money. He came out and endorsed Wes Fidel, who's running in Kerrville. It's like the largest district in the state of Texas. Hatch Smith raised $600,000. He's West Verdell's opponent. So West Verdell's the conservative. He's, I don't know, spent a couple hundred thousand dollars. Hatch Smith, just in the last three weeks, got $600,000 poured into his campaign. Again, the Austin Swamp is working very, 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 very hard to try to keep enough people elected that will just do what they tell them. And I'm very grateful that Donald Trump stepped in. He endorsed Barry Warnick who's a strong conservative Republican running against Morgan Meyer, who's the chairman of Ways and Means. But Morgan has been a major problem to conservative policy time and time again. So I'm very grateful. He endorsed Stormy Bradley against Drew Darby. Drew Darby's one of the most liberal Republicans. Hillary Hicklin against Hugh Shine. Hugh Shine's one of the most liberal Republicans in the state of Texas. I mean, a lot of these endorsements. And several people texted and emailed me and said, oh, well, why wasn't this guy endorsed? Or my state rep is this, and we have got a good person running against him. Why didn't they get the Trump endorsement? And I said this last week, too, just as a reminder, like it's when Donald Trump makes an endorsement, he only gets more enemies. Y'all just need to understand that. Donald Trump has like an 85% approval in most districts. So when he endorses, there's going to be more people that are mad with him than happy with him because 85% already like him. So when he goes in and endorses, he just gets more grief. So it's not like he wants to come in and endorse everybody. But the endorsements he's making matter. And each and every one of them so far have been endorsements that would move Texas to the right. So I'm grateful for his continued engagement. Um, I will remind you, post on your social media accounts, email your friends list and say, I voted, vote early. And then say, I voted and I've done research and I know the candidates that matter and I know who's good and bad. I know who's actually conservative and not. And if you want me to give you the list and tell you where to vote, I can. And you're going to get 10 to 15 people to reach out to you. If you just post on social media, you're going to get a message on Instagram that says, Hey, I didn't know there was an election going on. Where do I vote? And you're going to say at this library and here's a list. Thanks. Just take your driver's license. Awesome. And then an hour later, they'll go, oh, I voted. I was out running errands or the next day I voted. That person would not have engaged in the electoral process if you had not posted on Instagram. That is how this works. You have to remember that. You assume that all those patriots in your church that you sit next to on Sunday that you talk to and they say, man, I'm so concerned about the country. You assume that person's voting right now and they're not. That's just the reality. Less than 10% of of registered voters will vote in the Republican primary. Less than 10%. It could be a little over 10. Maybe it's 12. Maybe it's 13. It just depends on how the cycle ends up. But you need to know that it's up to you to put yourself out there. If you want to go a next level, then put your list together and text it to your friends. Literally text it to people you know that are close to you and say, I voted. Here's where you vote. Here's my list. Please go vote. And call me if you have any questions about these races. You could write that text and then just copy and paste it and send it to 25 people today, the next day. I'm giving you ideas of how you engage in the electoral process as a citizen, and you should consider it. Last but not least, I did write another song. And, you know, we've talked a lot on the show about how much Dade Phelan loves Democrats. And now you have... All these Republicans, Justin Holland, and, you know, going around going, oh, look, oh, we, we need Democrat chairs, guys. You don't understand. We can't even, I mean, the Democrats won't even let us build a road if we don't give them 15 chairmanships, eight chairmanships, 10 chairmanships, 20 chairmanships, however many chairmanships we give them. By the way, you want to know the right number for Justin Holland, however many the speaker decides. They're just like, whatever you decide is good. And evidently, that's completely necessary. Dade Phelan got so much pressure between his first and second session, he lowered the number of chairmanships, okay? So he took the total percentage and reduced it. And did we still pass constitutional amendments? Yes. So evidently, you can decrease the number and still pass constitutional amendments. So let's just decrease it next session from eight to two. 
and see if we still pass constitutional amendments. And if we do still pass constitutional amendments, then you can probably go from two to one or two to zero. We should just go from eight to zero. The Senate passes all those constitutional amendments. They don't have Democrat chairs right now. They had one Democrat chair last session. And Dan Patrick literally said, oh yeah, well, when he leaves, the Republican's going to take over. So the Democrats knew, like, this guy's the last Democrat chair and he's going to go. John Whitmire is now the mayor of Houston and he's been replaced by Pete Flores. So I, this was like three or four months ago that I was just, I wrote this song and I didn't have time uh, to do anything with it at the time because I've just been very busy, but I did want to try to get it out before the election. I thought about who to dedicate it to. Um, and it just was, uh, it's, it's been a real struggle with it. So I'm not going to dedicate it to anybody individually. Um, you know, Kate Whitman, Jared Patterson, some of these Cole Hefner, he's a big fan of Democrat chairs has campaigned for it in Smith County. So I was trying to think of some of these people maybe to dedicate the song to Dade. Of course we could dedicate it to Dade. Um, and so, but regardless, um, I just think it's important to remind ourselves of the relationship status that exists between Democrats and leadership in the Texas House right now and in that fact that it has to change. Hear me again. The relationship status that exists between Democrats and House leadership is far too close. It's, it's an inappropriate relationship. And so... I believe that that has to change and that's what happened in the Senate. And that's when it started passing a bunch of conservative policy and that needs to happen in the Texas house of representatives. So with that, and in closing for this show, I present to you, he raised me up and this is how we'll finish our show. God bless you. And God bless Texas. Mr. Speaker, a parliamentary inquiry, please take your inquiry. Do you know that I'm a Democrat? Thank you for working with us. I'm too far left. Some people call me Kami. A Democrat in Texas is hard to be. But I pass bills and kill some policy Cause Speaker Dade has put his trust in me Sit there, I've been a good soldier to him He raised me up, let me chair a committee he raised me up, my bill's his priority. I am strong when I stand on his short shoulders. He raised me up, I'm more than I should be. He raised me up. A soldier in Daddy Dade's army. He raised me up. I'm more than I should be. I'm so much more, much more than I should be.